Thank you for giving me your time to listen today. Today I'd like to give you a presentation about my research. The title of my thesis is New Fluorination Strategies and Reagents. Fluorine is an important element, plays an important role in medicine, diagnostics, as well as materials. One of the main challenges with fluorine is that it's challenging to introduce fluorine into molecules in a mild and selective manner. This has led to the introduction of fluorine being done at an early stage. This limits the ability of synthetic chemists to prepare fluorinated molecules from advanced intermediates, and often requires a complete redesign from fluorinated building blocks which are already commercially available. Another place where fluorinated molecules play an important role is as radio tracers for PET imaging. PET imaging is used to visualize diseases such as cancer, and may also be used to study metabolic conditions. Fluorine-18 is used in these cases, as it's a positron-emitting nucleide with a half-life of 109.5 minutes. Fluorine-18 is typically prepared in two different ways, through the proton bombardment of oxygen-18 containing water, as well as through the proton bombardment of oxygen-18 gas. In the case of water, 18F-HF is formed, but in the case of 18F-F2, it has to be extracted from the cyclotron target using elemental fluorine gas. That means that the resulting fluorine is diluted by the 19FF2 gas, so the final 18FF2 has a low specific activity. The takeaway from this is that if you want high activity fluorine, you need to use 18F fluoride, since it's prepared as a solution in water that can be used and converted into, for instance, 18F potassium fluoride, which can then be converted to your final target. 18F silver fluoride can be prepared through the treatment of a quaternary methyl ammonium cartridge, which has been pre-functionalized with triflate, and by passing the solution from the cyclotron through this, this is able to displace all of the triflate groups. Finally, if you elute the column with a silver triflate solution, you're able to elute off 18F silver fluoride. This is a procedure that was reported by Sanford and co-workers, and this is what we ended up using as our method for producing 18F silver fluoride. So this talk today will primarily feature on two areas of my research. First, the desulfurative fluorination of thiocarbonyls with silver 1 fluoride, as well as the fluorination of thionobenzodioxals with silver 1 fluoride, forming both difluoroethers as well as difluorobenzodioxals. So as I discussed in chapter 2 of my thesis, difluoroethers are one type of fluorinated motif which may be examined during the development of new APIs, fluorinated materials, as well as PET radio tracers. As discussed in chapter 1 of the thesis, Sulfur-containing compounds are known to undergo desulfurative fluorination under various conditions. The most precedented conditions among these tend to suffer from poor selectivity, often resulting in low yields, mixtures of products, or may require the use of hazardous reagents, which are often undesirable to work with. A promising alternative to these is silver-1 fluoride. The Schoenbeck group has examined the use of silver-1 fluoride with thiocarbamoyl fluorides. <coughs> as a method of preparing trifluoromethylamines, and in recent years they've expanded this work to include trifluoromethylhydrazines and trifluoromethylcarbamates. My work focused on the examination of the reactivity of silver-1 fluoride with oxygen-containing thiocarbonyl compounds, as discussed in Chapter 3 of the thesis. During our work on the desulfurative fluorination of thionoesters, we were able to demonstrate that silver-1 fluoride is able to affect desulfurative fluorination through the formation of silver-1 sulfide. This can be rationalized through the activity of silver-1 as a soft Lewis acid, which makes it easier for fluoride to add to the thiocarbonyl. Through the coordination of a second silver atom, this allows the elimination of silver sulfide, resulting in the formation of a fluorooxonium. This can also be called an oxocarbenium, and this can be attacked by a fluoride anion, giving us the difluoroether shown here. We are also able to trap this carbocation with two different nucleophiles, including phenol and DABCO, we were able to observe these adducts by 19F and 1HNMR. In addition to these experiments, we found that when we used this molecule here and treated it with silver fluoride, it underwent conversion to the corresponding difluoroether as well as this fluoroacetal, and this difluoroether when isolated and treated with base didn't afford this fluoroacetal either. So we know that this is going through an SN1-like process. This chemistry worked quite well, affording products in high yield with excellent functional group compatibility. A number of functional groups are tolerated, such as this silyl group, this cyclopropane, this quaternary ammonium group, as well as this oxetane. Not only did this chemistry work for aromatic as well as alkyl-containing substrates, a number of different heterocycles were well tolerated. We also have some rather exotic functional groups, such as this sulfinate and this vinyl ether. We were quite pleased with these results, and this is what ended up leading into our next chemistry. The difluorobenzodioxal motif is present in 
a handful of drugs, and has been examined in preclinical candidates during the development of new medicines. It's also been used in asymmetric catalysis, as is the case for difluorfos, shown here. This is a relevant motif that's currently challenging to make. We wanted to see if we could do this with silver-1 fluoride as well. When we explored this, we proposed a similar mechanism to the last one, where first silver is able to coordinate to this thiocarbonyl, and once a second silver is able to coordinate, this can result in the elimination of a silver sulfide and the formation of an oxocarbenium, which still has a fluorine on it. Once this oxocarbenium is formed, a slow process occurs where a second fluoride is added, resulting in the formation of this difluorobenzodioxal shown here. We were also fortunate enough to observe these two intermediates, where the fluorooxonium was able to be observed by 19F NMR. Now, most of the time when silver fluoride is used, it's just used as it's commercially available. However, it turns out that for this specific chemistry with the difluorobenzodioxals, it didn't work very well, and it turns out that it needed to be purified. So the way that we did that was through treatment of this, we were able to get this chemistry to be reproducible. I should just pull this whole section out. This is like not helpful for anyone. I'm just gonna get rid of that whole section. We were able to demonstrate that this chemistry works for a wide range of different difluorobenzodioxals, which were prepared from the corresponding catechols using thiophosgene as an intermediate. This also tolerated a wide range of functional groups such as the cyclobutane, the cinnamate, electron deficient, as well as electron rich aromatics, and overall this demonstrated itself to be a fairly good method for synthesizing difluorobenzodioxals. Earlier in this presentation, I mentioned the use of silver 1 fluoride for radio tracers. So we worked with our collaborators at Triumph, Dr. Matt Nodwell conducted these experiments, and we were able to demonstrate that 18F silver fluoride was able to generate radiofluorinated products with fair radiochemical conversion. So we were quite excited to see that this chemistry actually worked with 18F silver fluoride rather than 19F silver fluoride. So this was quite exciting, and we wanted to explore this chemistry some more, but thionoesters were well explored by us at this point, so we wanted to expand this to an even wider range. So to summarize my work with thiocarbonyls, I demonstrated that thionoesters and difluorobenzodioxals were able to be converted into difluoroethers as well as difluorobenzodioxals. Now, moving forward from this, we wanted to see if we could develop a new reagent that could access difluoromethyl groups, as the difluoromethyl group is also commonly present on its own in fluorinated medications. It's a very small group, so this would have more pharmaceutical relevance than the methods that we were developing before. And this led to the development of these two DMBDT reagents, the tetrafluoroborate salt, which is very electrophilic, and the methyl ether, which is less electrophilic, but can generate the carbocation in situ. So initially we had this idea, could we replace a thiocarbonyl with a dithiol? This would still be able to conduct the electrons between the two sulfurs, and perhaps if we could play with the electronics of this double bond, we could make it reactive enough to react with silver fluoride. So initially we took this commercially available starting material, 1,3-benzene-dithiolylium tetrafluoroborate, and treated this alcohol 3-phenyl-1-propanol. This forms this ether product, which would normally be used as a rather obscure protecting group. However, upon treatment with silver 1 fluoride, we were happy to see that this difluoromethyl ether was able to be prepared. After this worked, we prepared a suite of reagents and examined their relative reactivity compared to the starting material, compared to BDT. What we found was when we had electron withdrawing groups, as in the case of D and E, we saw reduced conversion to the desired difluoroether at 80 degrees in acetonitrile. However, when we explored electron rich cases such as C or B, we observed greater conversion. And the really high yield and low reaction time of DMBDT, the dimethoxybenzene dithiol led us to using this in our subsequent chemistry. So the way that this is prepared is relatively straightforward. Starting with this anthranilic acid, this is also no one at the committee meeting will care about this. This is what this chemistry looks like, and here's a large scale synthesis of our product, 20 grams. I tried seeing if we could get a custom synthesis of this done, but this is also not relevant. Now that we had a decent amount of this reagent in our hands, we were able to functionalize a number of alcohols to prepare difluoromethyl ethers. This worked, again, on a wide range of functional groups and worked for both primary, secondary, as well as tertiary alcohols. In addition to this, we explored the chemistry of that DMBDT methyl ether compound I mentioned earlier. This was able to functionalize a number of different nitrogen-containing heterocycles, and it was also able to functionalize indoles in the 2 position or in the 1 position at the nitrogen, depending on the conditions that were used. Once again, this chemistry worked really well. 
One downside was that this electrophilic addition worked quite well, but the difluoromethyl compounds that these generated weren't always super stable, which is one of the weaknesses of this methodology. However, despite that, this chemistry is really fast and we're able to get it to go in just under an hour. And we're able to obtain high yields in a very short amount of time under mild conditions. As such, we once again turn to our collaborators at Triumph, who were able to demonstrate that this chemistry worked on a couple of pharmaceutically relevant examples, including this testosterone, as well as this perfenazine. And finally, it also worked on one of the heteroaromatic examples on melatonin as shown here. In the future, this chemistry would be even more versatile if it was possible to introduce this dithiol to more molecules in more ways. One example of this would be the use of a Lewis acid in conjunction with this dithiol to produce this other dithiol, which could generate a difluoromethyl compound potentially upon treatment with silver fluoride. In addition, if the starting reagent were to be functionalized, so we had an F here instead of an H, this would open up access to trifluoromethyl ethers, which are also important in medicinal chemistry, as well as in material science and organic chemistry, broadly speaking. The most promising avenue moving forward for this would be the CH activation of this benzene dithiol using metallophotoredox chemistry to generate a carbon-centered radical that could undergo cross-coupling with an aryl halide to afford a wide range of aromatic substituted products. As this doesn't rely on the inherent nucleophilicity of the heterocycle, this allows you to build more building blocks with a dithiol on it allowing you to access difluoromethyl aryl compounds. So these would be three different routes of moving this chemistry forward in the future. And if I don't get to explore this chemistry, I hope that someone does. This should be changed to be the correct thing. In summary, I was able to prepare a number of difluoroethers from thionoesters using silver one fluoride. We were also able to prepare a number of thionobenzodioxals, which could be converted into difluorobenzodioxals, also using silver fluoride. Finally, I developed a suite of reagents which could be used to prepare difluoromethyl ethers from the corresponding alcohols. This also worked on heteroaromatics, and this chemistry is promising for potential application in PET radio tracers moving forward. Finally, I'd like to thank the professors that supervise this work, as well as my group members, both at Simon Fraser University, as well as Trinity Western University. I'd also like to thank our collaborators at Triumph, as well as our collaborators at Hoffman LaRoche. I'd also like to thank the funding agencies who supported this work, Finally, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions.